Hvis alle er tilbake, så har jeg nå gleden av å invitere til fortsettelsen av dagens program. Jeg håper dere har hatt en god lunsjpause, og at dere nå er klare for konferansens andre keynote speaker. Og jeg kommer nå til å slå over på engelsk. It is now my pleasure to have this opportunity to introduce our second keynote speaker, John Wolinski. John Wolinski is Kosler Family Professor of Education and Director of the Program in Science, Technology and Society at Stanford University. He is also a part-time professor of publishing studies at Simon Fraser University. And he also directs the Public Knowledge Project, which conducts research and develops open source scholarly uh, publishing software in, su in support of greater access to knowledge. As part of this project, he designed the open software um, system, Open Journal Systems, which is one of the most widely used journal management and publishing systems in the world, as well as the Open Monograph Press. And in light of our current situation here in Norway, where we are now in the process of navigating the realities and the challenges of the Plan S Joint Initiative for Open Access, the title of Wolinski's talk hits right at the heart of the matter, inviting us to look at the future of open access in a positive way. And the title of the talk is The Open Access Possibilities and the Promise for Research Libraries Today. So, dear Vira community, please welcome with me, John Wolinski. Thank you, Ingrid. Welcome, everybody. I had lunch with you, wonderful food. It's great to be here. It's not my first time in Norway, but my first time here in Stavana. I get that? Stavanger. No, no. <laughs> Let me start by noting a couple of things. One, I need to warn you. Uh, I'm afraid there'll be no PowerPoint. Uh, Uh, when I mentioned this at first, it was a little disruptive, um, and we finally raised the screen, and I didn't realize there's a whole theater here. <laughs> so I'm going to open with two acts <laughs> from Enric Ibsen's plays. I couldn't decide if I would do Peer Gint, um, but I looked through and, and I did a little research at lunch on Wikipedia, of course, and realized that an enemy of the people is really my theme today. Um, in particular, an enemy of the people that has, in a sense, been redeemed. Um, open access was an enemy of the people a number of years ago, um, and no longer. So, uh, as a tribute to Ibsen, as a tribute to being on such a lovely stage, um, I want to take that as my theme. But I have to note also that coming in uh, to Stavania, uh, coming in uh, last, not last night, the night before, at 11 o'clock at night, I'm exhausted, I'm ready to go to bed, and I look out the airplane window, and there's a sunset. At 11 o'clock at night, I check my watch twice. <laughs> and that wasn't the end of it. When I got off the plane and got in the cab, I looked the other way, and there was a rainbow. I took a picture so that you live in a land that is caught between sunsets and rainbows, at 11 o'clock at night in June, I understand that wouldn't happen in November, <laughs> is rather remarkable. But to be fair, it was the last time I saw the sun. <laughs> what I want to do is position myself. I'm a faculty member at Stanford University, and I work with Simon Fraser University Libraries, and that's the key. I'm a professor who has built his career on collaborating did you say exploiting? No, no, sorry. Collaborating with libraries. And that partnership started 21 years ago in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia and soon at Simon Fraser University. There are ones on the beach and ones on the hill. So they, the people on the hill refer to the beach as Deadwood uh, and the people on the beach refer to the hill as out of touch and as all that sort of thing. But for me, the library was the connecting point. So I both feel very comfortable here with an audience of librarians, and I feel, forgive me, empowered. Because we've been collaborating for 21 years, and I feel we can speak frankly to each other, that I can 
not admonish, but that I can provide some sense of where things seem from a faculty member's perspective in terms of open access and in terms of the library's role. Because when I say the library's role, I don't mean you, I mean we. My project, the Public Knowledge Project that I started 21 years ago, is based at Simon Fraser University Libraries. I've only ever seen one. Well, no, I have seen two. I guess it is libraries. And that partnership has been <clears throat> extremely productive in terms of my work. They have supported me at every point, from legal counsel to when there have been issues, to hiring and firing when there have been issues, to helping the project get grants from the Canadian government, to serving as the bank of our project, and that has been critical. And I want to talk to you about <clears throat> excuse me, ways in which you, as librarians, and those of you working in the publishing industry more broadly, can think about the library's role in the 21st century, in the digital era, in terms of what we can do. Now, I am an advocate, a card-carrying advocate. I show this at the airport all the time when they stop me. They always say, I want your passport, not your open access card. <laughs> so I'm not ashamed, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm proud of that aspect. We have reached a point of success at this point that I think we need to celebrate and I think we need to be concerned about. Very roughly, and the research on this is not equivocal, but it's, it's debatable because it's very hard to count. I mean, you could go right to Sci-Hub and say we've got 100% open access, or 85%, um, but that's not the kind of open access any of us want. The most reliable figures that I know of are those that speak about 50% of the current research. About 30% of the whole of research is freely available online. Not perfectly open access in a Creative Commons by licensing, but still freely available. In fact, to be honest with you, we're librarians, faculty members, we're together, no one's tweeting <laughs> this. A good deal of it is illegally posted. You're looking shocked, I know. <laughs> we know this. A lot of the PDFs that you can freely download, that faculty members are using in their courses, that others are relying on, that people all over the world are taking advantage of, are in contravention of their publisher's agreement. The very thing they signed so quickly and proudly when they got an acceptance. They gave away their rights in a second for the pleasure of appearing in this journal or that journal. And then when they get the PDF, they're just as happy and proud to put it up online in complete contradiction to what they signed earlier. All told, it adds up to 50%. The second 50%, if you're doing the math here, by the way, the second 50% is going to be more difficult, uh, just as difficult, but no easier. It took us roughly 20 years to get to this point in terms of open access. But what this point means is not really 50%. It means what is more remarkable in terms of being an enemy of the people. In the early 2000s, open access was declared by major publishers to be a threat to scientific communication. It was said to be something that would undermine peer review, if not put an end to it. Those people advocating open access, Ibsen would have said, were an enemy of the people. That's changed. The major publishers today forgive me for characterizing, are falling over each other to declare themselves open access publishers. Elsevier and Springer are going head to head to be the largest open access publisher in the world. In fact, it's the only thing that Elsevier is second in at this point. So what does it mean when we have all of the major stakeholders, the funders with Coalition S, the publishers, the libraries, always, thank you again. What does it mean, the authors even? In fact, I should pause for a second. 
the authors were among the most reluctant. In fact, I'm here before you speaking to librarians because I can't get an audience this big. I certainly cannot get an audience this big with faculty members. <laughs> Not many can, by the way. Sijek can get this big, but nobody else I know. So this idea that we have this agreement in principle among all of the stakeholders should make the last 50% easy, but it's not. So what about the role of the library? What I want to do is I want to take you through four principles, four aspects, and I want to conclude with a very concrete proposal for what we can do. But let me start with what librarians should be thinking about. And that is developing, the first principle, developing capacities on your campus for scholarly communication that is derived from your campus. That the library should be a center of scholarly communication is a given. You always have been. But the idea that it would be a site or a source for generating that content, not just, not just feeding or informing it with the works that are available, but actually a source of generation, a source in itself, is a really important aspect. Now, you've already done that with repositories. How many librarians here have a repository in their institution? An insti Whoa. Great. So that idea that the repositories are in place is itself not a source, but, but, a, but a place that is being kept. The newest idea that's coming down the pike, as it were, in repositories is the overlay journal. The ability to build a journal on top of the repository. The idea that faculty members who want to place their work at their institution may want to start a journal. Now, I would be the first to say that I want to get in nature. I want my picture on the cover of Scientific American. I want to appear in science. But I also want to recognize that faculty started journals. So I want to, so let, me, let me take a little more serious. I, I got caught up there in being, uh, my sense of the picture and being on the cover, my mother. <laughs> let me pause for a second. Let me acknowledge that I have worked my whole career with journals. And I have devoted the public knowledge project to supporting journals with software. And I recognize journals as intellectual centers, but intellectual communities as well. So for me, it's a non-starter to say that we need to replace the current journal system. It's a non-starter for me, I'm old school, that the journal is dead. But I recognize why some people are saying that. So on the one hand, the existing journal structure is something I'm going to be in favor of all the way through. On the other hand, I want to recognize that in the 1970s, women scholars could not get published if they were writing about issues that were called women's issues, as if it had nothing to do with men. So what did women do, women scholars? They started new journals in the 70s. Signs, the Journal of Women's Studies, and it was not easy for them to start a new journal in the 70s. They had to make proposals again and again to convince the publishers. The University of Chicago is a good example, University of Chicago Press, rather. We don't need that. We need the libraries to be centers of academic freedom. And when faculty members come to the library and say, we have this new field and it's tough to get published because people don't recognize this area. The library can say, I can do something about that. I am a friend of academic freedom. And whether it's an overlay journal, whether it is using open journal systems, which is what we developed, whether it is using B Press or any other system that's available, the library can take a much more active role today because of this digital revolution than the women scholars, the feminist scholars in the 1970s were able to do in the age of print. 
So let's celebrate the library's role in contributing to areas of academic freedom. And that can be radical in a feminist sense, or it can be a new area of mathematics that is not the least bit political. But there, your ability to advertise perhaps once a year to remind people that you can provide a role. The second aspect in which you can be a source is student journals. How many libraries here are hosting student journals of one sort or another? That many? <laughs> Wait, let me finish counting. Okay. You need to do this. You need to use the free open source software that's available online, of which I'm one provider with open journal systems. I did the infomercial yesterday. I'm not allowed to do it today. And invite academics to come together. Very briefly, I work with a number of journals at Stanford, but I work with a journal called Intersect in the Science, Technology, and Society program. Intersect does like the social studies of science. It's calling into question the algorithms behind machine learning in terms of their inherent biases. It's questioning the role of privacy in an age in which people are trading data. And these are undergraduates. What's stunning about this, for me, is we attract a dozen editors every year among the students to work on this journal that has peer review that uses a professional publishing system from submission, review, copy editing, and publication. They even have proofreading parties at the local coffee house and hit me with the bill. Twelve editors, none of them are STS majors. None of them are in the program because they see this intellectual center of the journal as a way for them to do critical work when their major doesn't allow it, when their computer science major says privacy schmivacy, what's the issue? We can encrypt. When their bioengineering program says normativity, just build it. They come to STS. So the idea that you could begin to advertise every year the possibility of students coming to the library to form communities around journals that invite critical engagement, or not necessarily, intellectual engagement in any field in which the students want to participate. And if no one shows up the next year and a journal only lasts for one issue, which is not uncommon in grown-up land either, by the way, you keep it online. You honor the authors that contributed to it. There's no harm done in that. It's a tribute. And then a year or two will pass and other students will show up and say, I saw that journal. What's going on? How can we begin to get that going again? And you'll say, it's in your hands. Now, in this role of academic freedom and student journals, libraries are not necessarily, in fact, I don't really feel they're the publisher. The publisher is the group responsible for the content. The publisher is the group responsible for the quality of the research that's published. Your role is as a facilitator or enabler. You're not the pusher. I don't want to you know, kind of get into that metaphor. But you can enable that process. You can provide them with instruction. You can guide them to where there are resources. You can help navigate that process of finding help of getting support. And in that role, you have begun to shift the position of the library. Second principle, we need to build the infrastructure. Now, when I say we, this is very selective. The infrastructure, the open infrastructure for open science, involves things like publishing platforms, involves things like open source software. And the advantage of working in open source software is everyone can contribute and everyone can use. Everyone can fork their own version and anyone can start a business on top of it. In fact, we've actually done that. But let me finish this aspect of infrastructure. 
Two years ago, I wasn't using this term, infrastructure. I try to stay away from words that have that many syllables when I'm giving talks, especially when English is not the native language, native tongue. Infrastructures become the key. Our friends at Elsevier, they may be represented here, are doing a wonderful job at assembling the infrastructure of scholarly communication. If you look online at Elsevier Infrastructure, you'll see they have purchased or built a great number of pieces. Repo uh, sorry, bibliographic management like Mendeley, uh, preprint repositories like SSRN, analytics and, uh, excuse me, article metrics like Plum, Psi value for analytics of research. They've assembled all the pieces because Elsevier knows where the future lies. It's not in owning content, it's in controlling infrastructure. I and others are working on building an open source infrastructure. We're taking our lead from Elsevier. I'm not ashamed. We're building a preprint system at this point. A public librarian in Los Angeles somehow had the money to give us a donation to build a preprint server. Yeah, a wonderful connection, Judy Ostrander. And I have these wonderful phone calls with Judy about how a preprint server will help the role of public libraries get access to more research in its early stages before it's been peer reviewed. And that possibility of building that infrastructure is something that libraries should look for an opportunity to either, or no, both, both, to install, and to contribute to. One of the things about open source software you have to be careful about is open isn't good enough. One of the things you have to ask yourself is how easy is it to install? And if someone tells you it's very difficult to install but it's open, you say no thanks. It has to be open in a way that is comprehensible, understandable, installable, upgradable. It has to be at a standard. And you, as librarians, can provide that feedback. At our site, we run a community forum with about 5,000 people signed up, each of whom feel it is a duty and a pleasure to tell us when it's not easy to install, or fix, or upgrade, or alter. They line up, apparently, and tell us, always with, we love this, we're so sorry, but really, could you do this? And at first, forgive me, at first, this is 15, 18 years ago, I was like, you didn't even pay for the stuff. But I learned that was so wrong. I learned that the right response is thank you. That the only way to develop open source software is to hear from the community. And the only way that you can get good open software for your, open source software for your library is to log into the community forum and say, hey, it's really good. Don't forget that part, okay? <laughs> it's really good. C'est bien. But tell us what we need to do. We have a list that won't take us into the next century, a few years short of the next century. And we prioritize it and we work with it and we do releases every six months, every, sometimes more often, especially when there's security issues. Let me go on. Third element is libraries need to participate in new standards of assessment for quality. Open access has changed the landscape. There's no question about that. Jeffrey Beale is going to speak tomorrow. Jeffrey? And Jeffrey, just to give you a little preview, not having spoken to him about this, but Jeffrey's done a wonderful job of drawing our attention to predatory journals. But the larger issue, and I'm happy to speak about that, but the larger issue is the role of the library in open access providing guidance. One of the most powerful tools comes from Lund, comes from Sweden, your neighbor, your friend, in terms of the of the Directory of Open Access Journals, DOAJ, from Lund, and Lars, the former librarian, is still running 
directory of open access journals, you need to help your faculty and students find that source. There is no better guide to open access journal and there are 10,000 titles in every subject area in DOAJ, Directory of Open Access Journals. On my side, in terms of this quality issue, I've worked with these journals that are called predatory. The title itself is a little bit controversial and the journals that get labeled as predatory are sometimes, or have said that it's quite unfair and I've worked with an, a few of them, not a lot of them, to help them upgrade the quality of their journal. Are they in DOAJ? Do they have the universities of their editorial board listed? Do they have a separate editor for each journal? All those sorts of things. We're actually going to change the way we build our operating system, open journal systems, to make it clear, to help the journals make it clear that they are legitimate, that they're holding to professional standards. One of the key elements is ORCID. We need to inform our faculty and our students about the use of ORCID as an ID for author disambiguation, four syllables there, people. What it means is, John, actually, I don't have an author disambiguation problem, John Walensky, no. But if Kevin Taylor is here today, Kevin Taylor has an author disambiguation problem, because there are a lot of Kevin Taylors. But ORCID provides a verified database service on faculty members. It uses third-party checks. It is addressable in terms of concerns. It's providing a new form or new standard. And faculty and students need to know about this, and libraries are the place to inform them. Crossref is another resource, providing DOIs for articles that allow to establish their legitimacy, to capture the citations. Although, again, these are things that can be gamed, no question about that. This is not a perfect world. But what has changed, what is interesting about this, is when all of the journals go open, the club is broken. That is, not the club, the Viking club, no, no, sorry. The club, in terms of the clubhouse, the clubbishness, where you don't need to explain. The New England Journal of Medicine and Nature, they don't need to explain they use peer review. They don't need to explain how they've decided what their lead articles are. We know them, we trust them, they're part of a club. That's changed. We want the whole world to participate, and if we want the whole world to participate in journal publishing and conducting research and getting it published, and we want all of the public to be able to use that research, then we need to stop using clubbishness buddy systems. We need to start making explicit what are our standards. And libraries can help in information literacy and other ways to, to guide faculty and staff in terms of that openness. Now, just one technical moment. I was told I would have a timer coming up here on my screen. It says I have four hours to continue speaking right now. <laughs> I'm happy to take advantage of it. <laughs> Actually, I've got till June 14th <laughs> to continue speaking. Let me go to my final, imagining that I'm coming to, to that point. The final point I want to come to is the one about the future for open access. What role is to be played? The libraries play a key role. There was a concern, I don't know if you remember this, I'm sure you do, you're librarians, when people said, we don't need the library anymore, everything is online, I'm in my pajamas working away on the latest research papers, I don't go into the library. In fact, we had this discussion yesterday about the library, I had a wonderful tour of the library, she said that I would not see any faculty, they're in their offices, in fact you bring books right to their offices. I know, you're spoiling them, okay? <laughs> I don't agree with that. And that's partly because I've built my whole career on partnering with libraries. If you go away, I'll fall over. I have been leaning on you for 21 years. Don't go away. What you need to do is take an active role in getting open access. 
but you don't need to do it alone. So I want to share with you the work we do at the Public Knowledge Project in advocacy for open access. I want to share with you the model that we're putting forward today, this week. It's changing, it's not guaranteed, but it's an example of the thinking that you want to be a part of and you want to contribute to. This is not the APC model, okay? Do we all familiar article processing charges? Yes, I'm seeing a lot of enthusiasm. People are really picking up on this. <laughs> Jasper, you're, you're a big fan, I can tell. So I'm in, I work in the, the intersection of the humanities and the social sciences. I'm a professor of education. I'm a school teacher by trade, largely social science. But I love working in the history of ideas. So in those two fields, humanities and social sciences, APCs are not only a non-starter, they're a killjoy. Nothing has put off humanities scholars more than APCs. They call it, well, I should be respectful. Let me think of a polite term for it. No. No. Oh. They call it vanity publishing. You paid the publisher to get your article published? Yeah, yeah, but it was a blind review. Blind with money in their pockets? Yeah, but th they reject a lot of articles. Oh, yeah? This is pure gint. I rec do you recognize that? It was Ibsen right there. <laughs> so, I take it as my responsibility, and I take it as your responsibility, because you are not simply STEM librarians. Maybe some of you are STEM librarians. Yes, okay. But the rest of us are root librarians. And the root is the strength and source of life. For those of us who are working in the humanities, social sciences, and STEM, we need a model that is universal. We have to stop talking about what works well in STEM, what works well in the biomedical field. Anything can work well in a biomedical field where millions of dollars are given in grants. They could publish in leather. Vellum, illuminated manuscripts would not be out of reach. We should not be taking our lead. So what does a universal model look like? A model that says it has to work for every discipline? Oh, and by the way, the world is bigger than the subscription list for nature and science. The world is a globe that goes all the way around and comes back again, and research has not yet done that. It's beginning to, it's present, but it's not completely accessible on a global scale. So universal has to be on that basis. So the model we're proposing, let me start with the catchy phrase, and let me give you a little bit of historical background. The catchy phrase I want you to hold in your head, I'm saying it now because I'm going to repeat it eight times, in a very subtle way not obnoxiously, subscribe to open, S2O, hashtag S2O, subscribe to open. You libraries are subscribing right now and your budget goes into journals in the extreme, but you're complaining, wincing, and paying for it. I'm saying if you said to the publisher, I'll write you the same check I wrote you last year, plus 3%, just make the journal open. How can the publisher say no? Oh no, it would cost us twice as much to make it open. No. It would cost us just the same to make it open. Yes. That's all you need to do, but it gets better. So we have journals, a number of them are going to pilot this. One is annual reviews, that publishes an annual review in about 35 different disciplines. They're putting five journals on this basis. They're saying to libraries, actually they're being very clever, we want 5% less. Like get the incentive, did you miss that? 
5% less if you subscribe to open. You give us 5% less than you gave us last year. Only the big difference is everybody in the world can read the journal. A tear welling up in the corner of your eye. <laughs> People, the library saved 5% and everyone in the world who has internet access, even on their phone, can read that journal. Wait, what about authors? Researchers, they can submit to that journal? Well, they could with subscriptions, only they couldn't read the journal. You can't submit to a journal you can't read. You don't know what it's like, what its standards are. So now every author in the world, researcher in the world, can submit to this journal. Tear in the other eye. Subscribe to open. Berghahn, books, social sciences, is putting 14 titles in anthropology in a subscribe to open option to current subscribers. Brill is deciding by mid-June, oh my heavens, mid-June is like one day, two days away. In mid-June, let's make this, tweet this, in mid-June, Brill is going to announce a number of journals, probably less than 10, but still, social science journals it's going to make open. I met with the Royal Society. They're not going to make any of their journals open next year, but they took the idea to heart. We're talking to the American Anthropological Association. We're talking to Communication and Media Studies. Subscribe to open. Now, I said it would get better. The 5% is good. It's very clever, because if, if you're like under pressure, you can say, well, I took the cheapest option. There could be a free rider issue because you don't have to do it, but what annual review says is, is it's only guaranteed if 100% of the libraries join. And so if a library says, well, I'm not going to join, then maybe it won't happen. Maybe they'll stay closed and the library won't get any access. Very clever kind of ploy, but I don't like cleverness, obviously. I like values. I like the sense of embracing it for a reason. So that's their take on it. Brill's and Berghans is a little different. But this idea of subscribing to open, I want to add one element. And that is, where the heck are the funders? Coalition S is making all of this noise about getting open access in 2020. Oh, sorry, not 2020. That was last week. 2021. What I want is the funders to stop free riding. What I want is the funders to pay for the publication costs of the research they sponsor. Stay with me, this is a little more complicated. I want each funder, Welcome Trust, to pay for all of the publication costs only of the research they sponsor. How do I know that? Because at the end of the article, it says, we gratefully acknowledge the support of Wellcome Trust for this research. They didn't give us enough money, but we managed to produce really good research with too little money. They don't say that. What they actually say is, we want to thank Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, the NIH, NSF, and four other organizations you've never heard of for sponsoring this research with enough money for us to go to eight conferences and to publish this paper. I want to use that to say that that publication cost should be covered by the researcher. So what does this mean? It means that in the biomedical field, in the area of PLOS, the Public Library of Science Journals, 85% of the articles have a funder. At least one, if not more than one. In anthropology, 25% of the articles have a funder. At least one, if not more than one. In the humanities, yeah, you're thinking, yeah. I was worried it was going to be zero in the humanities. 8% have. So across the board, mathematics, you're thinking to yourself, 60%. Science, generally, 70% in the samples that we analyzed. Some of those funders are not, are like departments, they're like somebody's aunt. 
You know, they're not all good funders. So maybe we have to cut those percentages in half. But think about it. When you subscribe to Open and you find out that funders are paying 20% of the cost of articles, what's left for the library to pay for? I, I, I taught school for a long time. This is called pause time. This is when everybody gave a chance for everybody in the class to work it out. And three of you are saying to yourself, what was the question again? <laughs> if the funders cover 20% of the publishing costs, how much is the library on the hook for? You can all say it. It'll feel good if you do. 80%. If you put it across the board in the biomedical field, you've never paid for PLOS. They've always been open access but you're only going to have to pay 20%. In the humanities, truly, you're going to have to pay 92%, if I get everybody, more like 95%. So this combination of library plus funder is a future I want you to at least consider. It is a possibility for you to take a stand on which journals are approved for you to use your acquisition expertise to approve and support open access journals and allows you to say the existing journals are good and I want to continue supporting them. We don't need to reinvent the journal. We need to change only one thing. What about the pricing? How is that going to bring down the pricing? Why don't you do open access and reduce all the prices at the same time? Look at the curtains. Try to imagine what would happen if I said to the publishers, I want you to reduce your prices and give us open access. That's what you would get. One thing at a time. Open access is the most critical issue today for the progress of science. For global participation in that science and research and scholarship, and the equity issues, and the intellectual issues, and the fairness, and the progress depend on that. We have seen that. Every journal that goes open access, their readership shoots up. Citations, the questions, I agree. So the possibilities for the future are in your hands. No, no, I forgot. The possibilities for the future are in our hands. In faculty members working with libraries and libraries reaching out to faculty members and students, in establishing your intellectual center, your position in the intellectual center of the campus as a source of both academic freedom and open science. Your site as a place of open infrastructure where students and faculty can turn to participate in this new openness, to contribute to this new openness, to demonstrate their commitment to research and scholarship on principles of global equity, principles of academic freedom. Over the next few years, you're going to have opportunities and decisions to make with regard to this issue. And you can take steps at any pace you want. But I'm coming back for the opening of the cathedral on its 800th birthday in 2022, is it? And then I'm going to ask you, what steps have you taken? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, for a very um, vibrant and Ibsen-esque and uh, <laughs> inspiring talk. We will now open up the um, two questions from the audience. And if you do have a question, please just raise your hand and we will get a microphone to you. We have one over here now, and one we're, over we're here. We're also open to positive comments. Yes, and comments, of course. Comments and questions. Yes, one question over here. 
um, loss in a um, red jacket over here. My name is uh, Lars Egeland. I come from Oslo Metropolitan University Library. I agree with you on your criticism on, on the APC model, but there are also problems with the subscribe to open okay. model. And one of them is, of course, that the big publishing houses will uh, they, their strategy is to earn more money on open access than what they have earned on the subscription yes. uh, model. We, we reject that. And, and uh, yeah, we, <laughs> and um, um, you you said that you would say that the libraries should increase their capacity to scholarly communication. Yes. You would not use the uh, word uh, library as publishers. No. Uh, and we have that discussion also in my library. I see Wikipedia defines publishing as the activity of making information available to the public. That is really the core mission of a library. Uh, and we publish 16 journals. I use the word publishing because we do the technical work, but uh, the editorial boards are on the faculties. But still, that's like the old publishing houses. They didn't produce the content either. And I think it's important to have more business models at the same time to make some competition to the mm. publishing houses. Very that's good. why libraries should, uh, uh, should work with uh, publishing. I, I totally respect that. And, and my distinctions about publishing are uh, very old school. Um, and so I, I think this competition thing that you raise is a very important one. Because if we get open access, we don't have monopoly ownership of content anymore. So we have a competition on publishing services. And your library may be able to provide better publishing services than some of the big corporations. So the competition is something I didn't get to, but it's a very important aspect. We, in the Public Knowledge Project, provide hosting services, publishing services, we call them. Um, not my choice of terms, again. I'm kind of old school in that regard. But however you refer to it, and I appreciate the Wikipedia being on your side. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Wikipedia. However you want to frame it is up to you. The principle that you raise about competition is a very important one. The whole building of open infrastructure is a competitive move. And so I think we can embrace that idea. The publishers do want to make more money on going open access. The APC, the pay and, uh, sorry, the pay and, no, 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 the publish and read or read and publish agreements, the transformative agreements are creating a whole new price structure that gives them that power. I'm saying to them with infallible logic, you used X to publish this journal last year, I'm going to give you X plus 3% or less 5%. I don't want to negotiate a new price structure. I don't want to open this up. I want to say you and I, publisher and library, notice this, I, publisher and my friends in the library have gone this far in good faith. I want you to respect that good faith. Now afterwards, once we've established open access, I want to renegotiate the price because you don't have ownership of the content anymore, but one thing at a time. Thank you. That's it. Do we have any more questions or comments out here? Yes, there is one in the back over here. Um, gentleman in the middle, um, waving his hands. You're going to have to shout. <laughs> Think of some questions. Uh, well, it's more of a commentary than oh, a comment than a question. I'm very happy we're talking about uh, open source uh, software. That's a blind spot in, in the library, I think. It's completely neglected. And the reason, of course, is because we have plenty of money. We don't care. We can pay whatever Microsoft wants us to pay or those guys out in the hall here wants us to pay. It's all good. But I think it's very good that you raised this, uh, this issue. Uh, Thank you. Perhaps not a, quite as forcefully as I would like, but still, <laughs> it's a welcome addition. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Next time, more forcefully. <laughs> the, 
This side of Any the room other? really is lagging here. <laughs> okay. No more questions, sir. Or there is one over here. Yeah. <laughs> you, you talked about uh, this open journal system. Yes. And uh, you said we should establish journals. Yeah. And uh, at our own institution, the University of Agder, they have established uh, a bundle of journal. But it's, it's easier to establish a journal than to maintain it. Sure. So there's a bundle of more or less dead journals there. Don't you consider that a problem? No. Um, I mean, I do consider it a challenge. Um, and we're, going to, we're building materials for, for student journals, a series of support materials. Uh, how do I collect, how do I encourage articles? How do I recruit editors? What are the standards? Um, but for me, I mean, the difference between print and online is online just goes on and on and on and on. And so what I would say is, and we have um, a journal of microfinance, a student journal of microfinance at Stanford that has only one issue. But I'm proud to keep it up, to maintain it, because it's, it doesn't cost. I mean, really, that does cost a little bit. Um, but the students' work in building that journal and collecting articles, I think, needs to be acknowledged and recognized. My hope is that another student will come to me on this, similarly with faculty journals. So I think part of our role as librarians uh, is to think about the preservation and to think about how this can be maintained. We use locks. The lots of copies keep stuff safe, so we back up our journals, and we have part of a lock system that at no cost will allow you to deposit your journal, so if it goes down into your institution, it remains present. I think you do, and this is the point about being a publisher, this gentleman raised at the front, I think you do need to think about how to promote and encourage and provide space and instruction, and we're doing that from our side, but libraries can do that as well. And I think an annual call seems appropriate to invite people to participate and even to jokingly say, we've got an opening in the Journal of Microfinance. We have right now no editors. <laughs> in fact, we're looking for an editor in chief. So that's a little flip, but uh, it, I don't see that as a reason not to make that opportunity available. It's not something you have to manufacture or create. It's something that you enable. Not every book in the library gets read. Certainly mine don't. <laughs> and so on those terms, you want to make that possibility. And it's not so remote. That is, there are, these journals are coming up all over the world. It's not like a, a, a false hope. These things are happening. And students take to open access like that. They take to open source software like that. They are very quick studies. They're not reliable. They don't show up every day when they should. But they are quick studies. Thank mm. you for the question. Mm. So we have time for one more question before ah. we have to close it. But over here, we have one. Nice rotation. Oh, OK. Good. Sorry. Then we'll, we'll try to make room for two. Hi. Oh, this uh, one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Ian Schroeder from Emerald Publishing. Um, one of the points you've made is um, you're looking for the sector to become more transparent and less club-like and, and more openness. I just want to get your thoughts on publishers who are exploring um, open peer review, open data on various platforms or levels, whether it's implementing or actually taking strides and bringing that to the market already. Yes, uh, I, I welcome that question. I have open data on my, uh, and open peer review on my sheet as well. So part of that open infrastructure definitely is open peer review. Um, we're working on it. We have one journal that's using it uh, with hypothesis for commenting and, and building in that kind of, of aspect. So open peer review is a bit shaky in places, but it is, it is part of that, whereas open data is crucial. So nothing is more important than open access, but open data is going to change science in a way that open access is just going to progress it. Open data is going to allow for reproducibility, replication. It's going to reduce the cost of research. People are going to reuse the data. 
The challenge in open data, and again, every library should be thinking about this in terms of their future, do you have a data librarian? A data, are there any data librarians here? All right. Every crowd should have one. Every country should have one. So the future around data is critical. The, the challenging aspect around open data is the standards. The standards for metadata, for reproducibility, the calibration, the units. Is it reusable? The future of the research article is going to be interactive data. We're going to use Jupyter Notebooks, we're going to use Stencilla, and we're going to be able to rerun the calculations right there in the table using the code that's open and shared from R to run the scripts to recalculate the data on different parameters. So you need to think about the future of information science, the field you're in, as having a very strong and challenging open data sensibility to it. I'm talking about tomorrow in terms of subscribe to open for 2020. Open data is going to take us years. Even in genomics, the most advanced field in terms of data curation, we still don't have a global standard. Francis Collins at the NIH is working with 50 other organizations to establish the way in which we calibrate and store and access genetic sequences. So that, that whole element is still to be developed. So if you're working in this area, congratulations to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure thank to be here you. this afternoon. And thank you. And thank you. And uh, Ingrid, that's great. Yes. And uh, on behalf of the, the VIRA committee, we do have a small token of appreciation for you. This is um, um, local chocolate, and it promises to give you a taste of the fjords of Norway, as well as an experience of being uh, close to the fjords of Norway. Okay. So well, thank welcome. you very much. <laughs>